You know, we all have a lot of data, and it has to positively, absolutely stay safe. It can't get into the wrong hands, and the biggest challenge we have is how to transfer it from here to there. We all know as leaders that legacy tools that transfer our important files and sensitive data are mostly outdated and fall short on security, especially with the demands of today's remote workforce. Relying on outdated technology puts our organization's brand at risk, and that is unacceptable. So we're excited to invite you to step into the future of completely secured managed file transfer from our friends at KiteWorks. KiteWorks is absolutely positively the most secure managed file platform on the market today. They've been FedRAMP moderate authorized by the Department of Defense since 2017. And unlike traditional legacy systems with limited functionality, KiteWorks has unmatched software security with ongoing bounty programs and regular pen testing to minimize vulnerabilities. And the coolest part, they have easy to use one-click appliance updates you will love. Step into the future of secure managed file transfer with KiteWorks. Visit KiteWorks.com to get started. That's KiteWorks.com to get started today. And now, the show. You ever wondered just how much of your personal information is out there? How much still remains long after you log offline? Did you know every time you click agree, to using a smartphone app, accept cookies on a website, or try or type in an online search, you're leaving behind an otherwise permanent trail, a digital footprint. It's valuable information that can and likely will be exploited. Exploited is a fancy word for used against you without your consent. Now imagine if you could reclaim ownership of your personal data. We sat down with Mr. Kurt Long, an entrepreneur, philanthropist, and former leader at the Kennedy Space Center, who worked on major United States national security and space exploration matters, including the Hubble telescope and more. We discuss unknown security risks from messaging apps, new approaches to safe and private messaging, and how to keep criminals out of your private data. More importantly, we talked about why online privacy is so critical and important to your personal freedom, your family's security, and to a free country. This is the story of Kurt Long and new ways to take control over data privacy. Come join us as we dive deeper behind the scenes of security and cybercrime today. Interviewing top technology leaders from around the world and sharing true cybercrime stories to raise awareness. From the creators of Vigilance, the newest global technology newsletter translating cyber news into business language we all understand. So please help us keep this going by subscribing for free to our YouTube channel and downloading our podcast episodes on Apple and Spotify so we can continue to bring you more of what matters. This is Cybercrime Junkies, and now the show. Well, welcome everybody to Cybercrime Junkies. I am your host, David Morrow, and uh, we have a special guest with us uh, here today. But before we introduce our special guest, uh, I am joined by my positive, always uh, uh, happy and intriguing co-host, Mark (laughs) Mosher. Mark, how are you? Oh, I love the introduction. Thank you, David. Hey, you know, I do get excited when we have some really great guests on, and we always have some really great guests. I am really excited today to have this man in the studio. Tell us who's joining us today. We are joined by uh, Kurt Long. And um, while you may not know his name, you certainly know his work. So he's the CEO and founder of Bunker. We're going to get into... uh, what that is and the benefits that we can all leverage 
in it and his mission behind the creation of Bunker and and what they're driving for uh, the public to secure our private data and communicate safely. Um, but prior to that, he held various advisory roles, major tech organizations, um, led and initiated and created uh, several uh, leading technology companies. Um, starting years ago before that, uh, worked on the Hubble Space Shuttle. Uh, he was a data bank engineer at Lockheed Martin, involved with the Hubble Telescope at the Kennedy Space Center, and uh, thereafter was a software engineer at IBM. So kind of bumping in, r- running the same circles that you and I did, Mark, no, back absolutely. in the day. Yeah, I don't know how our paths didn't cross. I don't know how we didn't meet earlier. Summer, right? Kurt, uh, yes. Welcome to the studio, sir. Thank you. Thank you for having David and Mark. Looking forward well, to it tonight. You know, we are we are honored to uh to to have you on. So um a little bit of background. So what was it that got you into wanting to go into engineering and the technology field originally? I just want I'm I'm always interested yeah. in people's origin story. Yeah. Yeah, you know, originally I grew up in Florida. And a person of my age, you could see the Apollo. As a a child, you could see the Apollo launches at night Mm -hmm. from across the state. And then a couple of few days later, you'd look on television and there'd be astronauts on the moon. And Mm. you felt connected to it. And somewhere around the age of 13, I wrote a letter to Kennedy Space Center. And they wrote back and told about the programs in the future. And that small token that they actually wrote back made it yeah. real to me. And that became kind of the inspiration for to the start of my career, which was at Kennedy Space Center. Luckily enough, I did work in the for Lockheed Space Operations and the real-time space shuttle launch data bank and was able to participate in Venus Radar Mapper and Ulysses, uh, which went to the sun, uh, Galileo, which went to Jupiter and launched mm-hmm. probes into Jupiter, and my ultimate goal was to be able to say I contributed in some way to the launch and, you know, the deployment of Hubble Space Telescope, which is just still ticking today. And that's how I got my initial start. That's absolutely remarkable. Um, where did you go? Where did you do your schooling at? I know, uh, but I would like you to share. It. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> University of Florida, which is mm-hmm. today's uh, number one ranked public school, according to the Wall Street Journal. Um, I huh? graduated there. Uh, went to the University of South Florida and pursued a master's degree in theoretical mathematics. And so, then so not real yeah. math. So you didn't want to do real math. <laughs> you, you, you just wanted to do the theoretical yeah. math. Is that, that what I'm one. understanding? So, you know, I still held out that I was a real smart guy, I thought. And then, <laughs> uh, you go, you know, and think of physics and math. And right. I did well. I don't want to paint a picture that I didn't do well, but you easily discover that in the realms of theoretical physics and math, <clears throat> you know, you get humbled pretty fast by the True. people who are who are pursuing there. You're like that, that, you're right? Pursuing, yeah. pursuing yeah. it, and they're in it to win it. And you're like, oh, so I should just graduate and apply <laughs> this, apply this to to some other career. But I'm not going to win a Fields Prize in math or a Nobel Prize in physics. Right. That's not going to happen. Uh, that's wonderful. Um, share with us a, a, about your about your work when you first began working uh, uh, through Lockheed and and work at the Space Center? Did, did you feel like it was a dream come true since you were a boy? Um, what was it like in the day-to-day now that you look back after many years oh, and reflect yeah. on it? Yes, it was a dream come true, and it remains a dream come true. And uh, – just the it was surreal because we worked literally across the street from the vehicle assembly building you know we were in something called complex d and so i would walk outside each day and you would see the shuttle the orbiter you know srbs being moved around by the crawlers or we could we were allowed to go over into the vap and you would see them stacking the boosters or you could go to the orbital processing facility the opf now you had to have pa- uh, special clearance um, or pass to get into the opf and we could go there and uh literally you'd come in on launch days and the uh the lights you could see literally from 30 miles away the whole drive in of the orbiter and the, the vehicle mm-hmm. and the pad same pads that spacex launches after off of today's pad a pad b 
And you would, the enormity of it all, um, just the absolute enormity. And there's this simultaneous thing of feeling super, super important to be a part of it, but like super, super super humbled, right? super small, you know? So this idea of feeling like you were part of something bigger than yourself and you just did, I didn't mind it. It was amazing. You didn't think of your, the smallness of it. You only thought of, of how lucky you were to be a part of it. (laughs) That's so it absolutely. Seems like, yeah. It seems like it would be just mind blowing to be on site for one of the launches. So, were you at Kennedy for any of the launches? And if so, what was the most memorable? Like, there was one that just hit you with the chest more than the others. Uh, you know, it's uh, yes is the short answer. Yes, we would stand outside the LCC, the Launch Control Center. Um, only later did I realize that we were standing outside. Um, closest humans to the pads and the LCC was right behind us, but they had like these louver doors that could shut if anything went wrong. Um, on the and you pad. guys were on the outside of <laughs> we them? Yeah, we were on the outside. <laughs> and you're like, mm, maybe I should have thought us. this through. Yeah. And literally you would just kind of hear and feel the rumble of the, uh, the shuttle launching come across you from three miles away. Yeah. And ultimately the sound waves would press all your clothes back against your body. Wow. Physically your clothes would be pressed back against you. And, um, you know, is that was something you never forget. And, and the windows would rattle across Brevard, Brevard County and on the landings, I'll, you would hear the double entry of the nose, uh, creating, they were, kind of blunt edges. If you think about the shuttle, it has two blunt edges. It's the nose and then the uh, wings. And you would hear the sonic booms uh, of the shuttle returning all across Brevard County, but particularly if, you know, if uh, you were there on site when they landed at Kennedy instead of Edwards. And then the memories, you know, the uh, night launches were particularly spectacular. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, And, uh, and, uh, you know, on the, on the difficult side, you know, I was there for Challenger, staying outside Ooh, when we lost gosh. Challenger. That's Were why I went really? back. And, yeah, I went back oh. and got a master's degree in the theoretical math at that time and came back and applied that math degree to, to the program, you know, and, and just seeing, you know, the takeaways from that are seeing, you know, these are amazing men and women, um, of the program that both support the missions, go on the missions. But on that one, you know, the the idea that, you know, just how hard everyone had worked for quality control. And right. it, I've never been involved in anything where we worked harder and my bosses were harder on me for quality control than that group of people. So uh, we weren't flippant and these yeah. everyone was devastated. But what impressed upon me is we were going to keep going. Uh, the astronaut corps didn't flinch. They kept going. The men yep. and women of the program, while we all cried on that day and days after, yep. absolutely got up and kept going. And I was like, oh, so this is how you do it. You you might suffer a loss, but you're going to learn all these lessons from it. You're going to take it in and you're going to keep going and we're going to persist and we're going to keep going toward the vision. And so being part, being part of something bigger than myself and persisting in the mission through difficulty with the examples of great men and women uh, influenced me foundationally the entirety of my life. Phenomenal. That's great insight. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. Yeah. Sure. So, so as you, you have a lot of accolades, so I don't want to like rattle them all off exactly. and all of the companies mm-hmm. that you've bought or been part of advisory mm-hmm. councils. Cause we could be here for like two hours. Mm-hmm. Let's not do mm-hmm. that. You've had a great career. You've, you, you've done a lot of good. And, um, one of the organizations that you did was fair warning. So, mm-hmm. um, back in the day, I've had a lot of healthcare, healthcare security, healthcare IT experience. So fair warning, can you walk us through fair warnings mission? They were ultimately acquired by, um, uh, Im- Im- Improvada and, Correct. um, and, uh, uh, but they were in what over 8,000 healthcare yep. organizations and facilities across the U S what, what yes. was, what was fair warning? What, what, what did it serve to do? Stay with us. We'll be right back. You know, we all have a lot of data and it has to positively, absolutely stay safe. It can't get into the wrong hands. And the biggest challenge we have is how to transfer it from here 
to there. We all know as leaders that legacy tools that transfer our important files and sensitive data are mostly outdated and fall short on security, especially with the demands of today's remote workforce. Relying on outdated technology puts our organization's brand at risk, and that is unacceptable. So we're excited to invite you to step into the future of completely secured managed file transfer from our friends at KiteWorks. KiteWorks is absolutely positively the most secure managed file platform on the market today. They've been FedRAMP moderate authorized by the Department of Defense since 2017. And unlike traditional legacy systems with limited functionality, KiteWorks has unmatched software security with ongoing bounty programs and regular pen testing to minimize vulnerabilities. And the coolest part, they have easy to use one click appliance updates you will love. Step into the future of secure managed file transfer with KiteWorks. Visit KiteWorks.com to get started. That's KiteWorks.com to get started today. And now, the show. Um, just briefly, the origin story is that uh, somewhere around 2004, I recognized that eventually the bad guys would make it to healthcare because uh, they had the same information and more as a lot of financial organizations and the banks and the finance companies, especially the banks had gotten, they tightened it up. I mean, they, yeah. you know, you they had to be pretty to. determined. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so I ended a lot of co cocktail conversations by telling people we were going to do info security and healthcare because they had a reputation of slow and not value and security. Yeah. But we persisted and um, we, you know, just persisted over time. And ultimately, the idea, and we did this in patents uh, as well, technology and execution was we invented the category of patient privacy monitoring, which said mm -hmm. we're going to examine the activities around healthcare records and the many applications that support healthcare, and that we will watch for signatures of identity theft and other kinds of information crime. And I, I always wanted to tell this. I, I don't think I've ever told it publicly. On the first day we ever ran the product in a, a customer environment, my CTO, he called. And he goes, Kirk, there's, we found 80 incidents. I mean, what do you mean? And, you know, it's always what? like it's early on. And you're like, what? Like that's a, in your head, in your heart. And you're like, oh, I'm going to get this really good news. Kind of like I know that sounds bad to say really good news. Right. But we didn't know. We weren't sure. Right, And then it's going to find out, well, it's not real. Well, it was real. And on the first day, the first time we ever ran the product, oh. it was people looking at uh, VIPs and looking at their neighbors and looking at their coworkers. They were going crazy. Oh, and so it to be forthright, um, it went from there. I mean, that was pretty innocuous cases over time. That became medical identity theft. And you, mm -hmm. you probably know that the payloads of a medical payload yeah. on the dark web became something like $50 versus a financial payload of $5. Mm -hmm. It became uh, opioid redistribution and Medicare fraud, and, and it exploded into all these different scenarios, including anonymous attacks on medical centers yeah. To, yeah. to show that the government of a certain state knew about lead levels in the water. And so we were at the forefront of that and felt like we did. Uh, we had a great business and uh, super proud of everybody, but also a profitable business that ultimately had a positive financial outcome. And at some point in there, I needed a break for that after about 15 years of seeing what humanity was capable of and <laughs> living that every single day. And like, okay, you mean the world that we live this. in? Like, like we're on the yeah, Stupid yeah, Crime yeah. Junkies yes. podcast. Like, this right, is our world. Because yeah. you can't make the crimes up. Like you, you, no, you, you don't need to. Think. There's never, yeah, for the, and, and as our listeners know, there's never a lack of content. There's so uh, much. We, we just literally figure out what should we report on. Like what yeah. should we talk about this time? Because there's so much coming every single day. I have it's, to tell one quick story. Was please your, do. I saw yes. you interviewed Brett Johnson, right? Yeah, so the original, to, cyber, oh, the original God, dude, cybercrime he, godfather. When you listen to him go through the things, and I, my the one that stuck with me is the IRS tax fraud thing. Yes. Because what would happen at the hospitals is they would pay the registration desk for patient information sufficient to create a tax return. Mm -hmm. And when that thing hit, it went nuts because they would have literally houses with people filling out false tax returns. Yes. And so when I was lit and we would try to guard against that, we would have to monitor for yep. exports of pay. 
And so when I heard Brett tell me, sir, I'm like, so you're the dude that yeah, he is the, the dude. Yes. <laughs> yes. Like, he's the it dude that did that. Do you know how exactly. many stories he's tied to? Like we've met him in Most person. We, 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 that, right? Yeah, he's yes. really good. He's tied to so many stories. Like there's this one story with the, the largest crypto exchange in, in Canada, Ger- Gerald Cotton, who either disappeared or died at a very young age. Yes. And, Right. And then and all of a sudden we find out through Brett that he worked for him. Like he had worked <laughs> yes. for Shadow Crew back in the day. Oh. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so <laughs> crazy. He was like the original godfather of the dark. Yes. You know, the like, most interesting thing about him, Kirk, is he is actually yes. like that all the time. In person, he's always like he's always that. Always like, all he's the time. Always on. Oh. He is always in well, character. Well, he is a yes. bright, creative guy. That's there's no doubt about that. Right. Yeah. Now he's got himself aligned for the hopefully the force of good. I think he is. Oh, yeah. he absolutely yeah. is. He absolutely yeah. is. Yeah. And 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 you know, and that's not. It's hard, right? Like when you know how to do it illegally, right? And you could do it a lot easier illegally, but you value you know liberty bet more, and he values his family yes. more, and so it makes perfect sense. But yes. um, so so let me ask you about fair warning before we mm. tran- uh, transfer away from that topic. Sure. D- would it alert the actual individuals or would it alert the hospitals? Hospitals. Like the hospitals. OK, yeah. that's what I Designated yeah. persons at the hospitals. And then over time, right. we added a managed service team that became super successful. Makes um, sense. Because like in the end, they did not really have the the right people to sufficiently investigate. And then everything we ever did, you had to have the psychology of this is going to a court case. This is right. legally, well, you know, it, it's chain of got custody. To be chain, you have to figure out chain of custody, thing. all of it. No, yep. it yep. All of it. And so that was the business we were in. I you know, tried to impart that. People have a hard time believing that what they do is that impactful. But over time, with story, you could communicate mm-hmm. everything we do has to stand up in the court of law. And yep. so we got really, really good at that and did that for our customers, for many of them. Others could do it for themselves, but they tended to be the really big, sophisticated enterprises. Right. It was a much harder sell back in 2004, too, right? Because cybercrime yes. wasn't in the new. I mean, it really wasn't until... What, Mark, 2011, 2013, yeah. that it really, when they started productizing the malware and creating the ransomware as a service gangs, and they, right. they really got organized. They um, did. You know, and uh, and now the, if it's a, if it's a ball game, they're winning right now. So, um, yeah, the score is 7 you know, 15 to 2. <laughs> yeah. Right now they're winning, but I'll tell you, there have been a lot of strides in the last year by by international law enforcement that are pretty exciting to watch. Mm, but, yes. um, yeah, it's good. So tell us, and then one of the things since you've evolved, you're, mm-hmm. you're, you're driven by the uh, Long Family Force for Good mm-hmm. Foundation. Could you mm-hmm. share with ladies and gentlemen what that is? It's been an evolution. We always did a lot in philanthropy over the last say, fifth, at least 15 years. Let's just say 15 years. And initially, I thought of things as like you want to provide goods and maybe programs to people who otherwise can't have them. Yeah. Um, but they always have unintended consequences. So, for example, just mm-hmm. take a famous shoe company that might give away a pair of shoes when they sell a pair – when they sell shoes – and maybe they give away those shoes to someone in Africa or, or an underprivileged place. And what you start figuring out is, oh, wow, so there's an entrepreneur in Africa who wants to make shoes and sell those shoes locally. And that would be a livelihood and that would create economic ecosystem. So whenever you're giving all these things away, there's a uh, consequence, an un- unintended right. consequence. Unintended that needs- consequence. So we really got behind the idea of building people spiritually um, and maybe making them do the work and providing frameworks for them to think about it. So uh, uh, something that we'll announce uh, publicly, uh, I guess I'm announcing it here, but it's been signed. You heard it first here, folks. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, like with the Hamilton Center at the University of Florida, we just made a $1 million donation toward what's called civil discourse the idea that we can talk to each other without love it escalating 
And there, the president of the university is committed to teaching that specific course to a population of 50,000, 55,000 persons over time. Wow. And we think that's fundamental to society. Of Absolutely. Listen, we have to be able to control ourselves. That. Yeah. So that would be an example. We're going to have more announcements, but that would be an example. There's many, many others that we're doing, but that one I'm particularly proud of because I, we've lost that in our society. Yeah, you should be I proud of that. Now, I mean, that is such a crucial initiative. I mean, at this point in history, all of civilization, nothing yes. could be more meaningful than exactly what you just described, or at least in Latin, and that's the last thing. Yeah, I mean, we, I we've really right. polarized. We've become very polarized, and some of it, technology is not helping, right? Because of the algorithms and the way they're based, somebody will hear an event that occurs, right? Some tragic event yes. or some other event, and because of our feeds and what we're pro our proclivities, right, we'll hear it through this filter. Someone else yes. in another part of the country, or in the same part of the country, but has a different. Uh -huh. political outlet uh, outlook yes. or whatever has a different algorithm they're going to see it in a totally different way and we're coming at odds based on how we receive the information right from the beginning and so we yes. really do need that 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 ability for for civil discourse yeah. um i feel like we've lost a truth making process for the modern world like i bet mm -hmm. you all of us suspect at least all of us would agree that Anytime you read something now, you just don't know whether it's true, whether it's from your favorite news source, your least favorite news source, you read it. Absolutely. And you're like, I, that, it's probably true. It might be true. But I'm going to – how long is it going to take me to figure out if it's true? Yeah. Um, well, it's going to take a while. Yeah. And so with advancements we, in technology like synthetic well, AI, media, deepfakes, everything deepfake, now. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we, we have a whole series on deepfake coming up in the next couple of weeks. And it is brutal. Like yeah. the advancement just in the last six months where they now are launching, you know, live stream capabilities for deepfake where yes. video and audio, you can just program it to have a certain background and education and let it go. And it will just yes. be you answering questions like this. I mean, if that really goes the way it is, the benefit will be, I won't even have to do these podcasts. I'll just like <laughs> put it on and be like, here's the guest, here's the guest bio. The Ask them some good right? questions. Yeah. And I'll watch myself. I'm like, I could ask that one better. I, let me, let me jump in there. You guys probably saw the Hong Kong uh, yes. 20 million. We were that just was the, talking about that. Exactly. That was the first one. Is that the first one you guys had seen where it was literally a group video fake? Had you seen anything before yeah, that? Yeah, it really was. It really, I mean, the FBI <laughs> had alerted back in July 22 mm. of deep fakes uh, where people were applying in the U.S. Several hundred examples, keep in mind, where people were applying for remote jobs and mm. they were deep faking those videos. They were operating under stolen credentials. Several hundred people had been hired, given the keys to access to company networks and then we're stealing yeah. that data so the fbi issued yes. the fbi issued that alert but we have not seen the level like no, we did in that hong, hong kong, kong bank and yes. for, for for listeners who haven't seen the deep fake episode because it hasn't launched yet but what happened there was a uh, cfo located in the united kingdom uh emails does business email compromise right so somebody impersonating the cfo in the united kingdom emails person in Hong Kong asking for 20, several, several wire transfers for a secret transaction, confidential transaction for the organization. They question the email and they say no. And the CFO gets them on a video call with seven or eight other people. All of those other people were deep faked other than the mark, other than the, the target person. Yep. And they convinced the person they were there live. They could ask if she, he or she could ask questions, right? And get the questions addressed. And they proceeded to make multiple transactions totaling approximately the equivalent of $25 million. In the US. Yes. Unbelievable. Yes. Crazy. Unbelievable. It's, it's absolutely And we crazy. know there's more to come, right? We all, we all know this is. No, I think that start. was the shot across the bow. I think yeah, that was yeah. the very first yeah. 
uh, there are so many groups as we look at dark web chatter that are formulating campaigns around this now. So we're going to see, and, and the, well, the scary thing is not that, because every good invention has misuse and abuse. Every good medicine has misuse and abuse. We get it, right? But the medicine outweighs the misuse and abuse. But what's scary, what's scary is the organizations, at least here in the United States, I, we work with them every day, every week. Not one of them has deep fake detection on their initiatives, right? Yes. Uh, like, like, what is your plan for deep fake detection? It's not even like, on the whiteboard. It's not even on the whiteboard yet. That's the it's scary crazy. thing. Is this is real? This is coming. We see it coming, and nobody's prepared, and that's what concerns me. So, if you want to, you know, jump in that pool yeah. right now, like if you want to come out of retirement a little and save the day for that, that would be. We could use. We could use some theoretical math help on that. Yeah, you know, so the watermark, you know, they're trying to have this watermark initiative. Um, yeah. It looks like the deployment of that wide scale and the application of it to video yeah. is going to be a handful, but I'll leave it to the mm -hmm. PhDs. Like I said, there was some some PhDs there that, that had me in the math department. So I'll let them, uh, I'll All let right. them use their, their will on that. I, just, I po possibly found your next calling. I just didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> hey. So let's talk about let's talk about bunker because yep. bunker is a very unique and you know we're we're product agnostic on this podcast mm -hmm. as well as in our professional lives. Um, but this is something that all of us individually could use. And what I love about it is you guys have made this extremely affordable for everybody. It is mm -hmm. like ninety nine cents a year for the basic mm -hmm. plan and you get mm -hmm. all the way up to i believe what is it eleven dollars for the pro plan yeah. a year mm -hmm. so yeah. we're going to raise the price on that pro plan but on um, i, I want to find doing the, that i think that's fair i want to i want to keep the 99 cent version as long as we can and we mm -hmm. will because it's kind of like this idea that everyone on earth deserves bank level security mm -hmm. um and and we want to keep that spirit and of course we'll add new things and we'll eventually right. that pro play will get more expensive, but, but I love the 99 cent thing and, and uh, it's worked really well. Yeah. So let's share from a high level. Um, from my understanding, it can operate as a password manager, a secure mm -hmm. messaging, right? Where it's mm -hmm. invite only, uh, mm -hmm. secure cloud storage. Uh, you create files and then you share those out. It blocks SMS attacks so it blocks mm -hmm. the spam it blocks you know smishing sh attacks um and it it's it, security at a level of banking so it meets compliance standards mm -hmm. yeah well wow. i mean so the first yeah. thing and you you know i saw the question you know before it said what you know talk about how to protect yourself and i want to do that just a little bit and that is yeah please we have the uh, the public happen when it has to accept first and businesses as well. So I, I can blur this together into business and public. Mm -hmm. You have to accept there are bad people on this planet and they prey upon the vulnerable. It's, I, it's a hard thing for people to get their head around because most people are pretty right. good. And if they see someone in trouble, they're thinking, how can I help? Or I need to tell them that uh, how to help them. It's how bad guys work. They love it when someone is vulnerable it, 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 and, and they're going to exploit that. And it's even better if they're a high value target. So the first part oh, is like, yeah. accept that. And then the spirit of bunker is the same thing you would do in a business. It's reduce the attack surfaces. I've always mm -hmm. loved the idea of in a business that to say, where's the most valuable information? And then where are the attack surfaces to get there? And so in the, for the public, individual users, families, you know, normal people, same applies to business, but the first attack is like passwords. So let's mean right. we all know how, how passwords are exploited and sold on the dark web and stuff, account stuff. Everybody's and all these things. got so, a good password, but they reuse yeah. it. They all they reuse, reuse it. it. Right. Not That's all the they biggest that. danger. Not loving to do that. So we're like, let's have a password manager. And then if we think in terms of attack vectors, email and text remain these attack vectors that are 
they were never really designed as as, no. as communication protocols or communication methods for conducting commerce. And so they allow imposters to reach out to you. So if your information, whether it's a phone number or your email address, winds up on the dark web, yeah. you're going to get imposters come in. So you're like, well, how do you eliminate that? Well, it's invitation-only messaging where you have to know the person, accept the invite, or send an invite, and that you have to mutually agree. And that gets rid of all the spam. And that gets rid of all the all the imposters coming at you um and then and then the secure documents um having those compromised whether it's your social security number account information wiry instructions is a huge one every week right. i talk to someone right. who has a friend and so we wanted to combine that all into a single product that every family could afford and literally you know eliminate um and you know the, the the architecture of this thing is such that it's zero trust interiorly wow. attack vectors eliminated other than a specific port that we can monitor and have um, authentication around and, and access tokens internally and nail the dang thing down and make it easy enough for a family or an individual use to use. That's the spirit of it, um, Mark and David. I like that. And, and oh, it's yeah. a it's a mobile app. It operates on Apple devices as well as um, Android devices. Is it also available on like a browser, like a PC or Mac? Or is yeah, it it's, uh, I'd call it desktop. So oh, desktop. It, okay, very good. Yeah, so I would just I would call it desktop, and it's a self contained secure platform uh, on your desktop. We we eliminated any uh, browser access. Uh, we felt like that had security issues. We ran that yes. in the early days a little bit. Felt like maybe corporate clients could use that, but ultimately, year year ago, just said no. We're just taking that off the table. So it's Google, uh, Android, iPhone, desktop on Mac, desktop on Microsoft as well. That's fantastic, and the the price point is 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 great. When cool. you've when you've had conversations with um, uh, organizations, what is there any pushback? Like, are do do people not believe it or do they not find the value in it i'm just curious what could there be challenges like why have i not why I, have i not heard about this before i had you on the podcast is my question like why is this not on the super bowl like halftime show I, ad I, other than maybe that's really expensive and maybe not useful but i mean crowdstrike well, we, was on there they stopped breaches apparently so i yeah. you know i just want to <laughs> i just want to know <laughs> Um, well, first off, we brought to market a year ago. I mean, we just, not even a year ago. So we just brought to market and went through the process of that. So we've kept it pretty low, um, low profile. We're expanding that now. But, Good. you know, before I get too far down that path, I want to say from pushback, right? Who do you trust today in yeah. the world of tech? Like, so we're, right. I expect, and it, uh, I would be disappointed. If people aren't skeptical to say, who are these people and right. should I trust them with my yep. most important information? Because that's the ask. We're asking right. to yep. trust us yep. with your most important information. And we're going to have to earn trust in the marketplace. And we're doing that by involving all kinds of great people. Um, you can now see your some board of, of advisors is stellar, by the way. Including – we want them to try to break in like gray right. hats, white hats. You know, we've, we've involved great people. I, I interrupted you, David, but we, mm. we're going to have to earn credibility in the market. And I expect to do that. And I'd be disappointed if we didn't have to, and, and we'll do that over time. And, you know, we're growing a lot, um, but, but, but we're going to have to earn trust in the market. It's going to be the number one issue. And I have no problem with that. That's fantastic. I love yeah, the mission yeah. behind yeah. it. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it, it's very helpful. I mean, it's something that, especially families, right? Because so mm -hmm. many families barely do anything. Like they don't really take the step f to focus on security. So this is a very low bar for entry to, mm -hmm. and, I, and I don't mean just the price point. I mean, mm -hmm. convenience wise, you've really made it very simple to use and very simple to engage. You know, and and one of the things we haven't talked about yet is it really does 
protect against some of the risks in a lot of these other messaging apps. So share with us what your experience is with, with some of the other messaging apps, because there's a lot of issues with them. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to get off the reservation on this. In other words, you, you may or may not agree with what I'm about to say. And I, I believe, welcome I believe, the, you know, that we've had Brett Johnson on the show. So, <laughs> yeah, so this is, here's this is about the platform is yours, man. Go ahead. Like, Look, I'm just here's kidding. on the messenger platforms. You know, when we talk about attack surfaces, this is what I've come to see play out in the marketplace is like email and text are just so vulnerable to data right. collection, man in the middle attacks. And, you know, the, you know, Apple's move their policies around their encryption techniques around. So I don't want to throw Apple completely in that category. But in general, email and text make you super vulnerable to data collection and to imposter and tax. And then you say, well, what about direct messengers? And so we kind of get into this WhatsApp category, yep. mm -hmm. Snapchat category. Um, and then, and then they're, they're kind of in, and even Wicker when Wicker was around mm -hmm. and, and then what's the, you still have the imposters. Then you get into signal and now you're going to have dot tox. I don't know if you're following tox yep. or matrix. Oh, of course. And yeah. I mean, I mean, if you get, if you get attacked in a ransomware attack, the first thing you have to do is go figure out tox and get on a tox <laughs> channel and start negotiating with a Ru Russian ransomware gang. So people will eventually find out all about tox channels. <laughs> find out all about so, them. Do you really Mark? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> And yeah. that's the side. So here, here we go. Here's my assertion is that what has happened in the tech industry over time, and I've been a part of it, you know, I've been on the journey and didn't notice, but we've, we've really allowed a culture of, 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 of crime to break out in our country. And the tech world is, is supporting that. And uh, whether it's that we've 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 legalized drug use in some you know in, in some states, or whether it's that we we don't prosecute aggressively, or there's there's all these factors where crime has become ubiquitous as we go outside our homes and even in our homes, and you can feel it. Um, we all feel a little bit more under threat, and we know that there's drug distribution. About 1.7 trillion dollars of illicit drugs are used in the world. Uh, there are um, uh, 150 million people involved in human trafficking that are enslaved in some way, mm -hmm. $150 billion industry. There's about 6.3 million sex workers, um, many of them children. And, and what's happened is the secret messengers, to be forthright, uh, in my opinion, are the backbone, the communications backbone and, and used for the rendezvous points yeah. and all that. Oh. And you come, up. and so for me, it's like I I don't um I don't want government surveillance, and and I'm not a giant right strict guy, but I want to live in a country that has some balanced law and order, and mm -hmm. as long as we're allowing these messengers to more and more and more s support the needs, you know we're we're out of balance on the Fourth Amendment is the best way to say it. So. After yeah. Snowden and, and, and Assange, you kind of get this backlash against the Fourth yeah. Amendment, privacy, the, the warrantless search. I, I, I was in that business. I, I, I understand it. We want to guard against government surveillance and FISA 702. I get it. Uh -huh. But we've the other side of the Fourth Amendment says that with a warrant – with a warrant, the government can collect evidence. And what's happened there is people who are victims of crimes, uh, and I bet you all of us could sit here and tell crazy stories, maybe not directly against us, but people we know of crimes that yeah. are new. Well, the government, the, 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 whether it's the FBI, local, whatever it is, if there's a warrant, as citizens, we need to step up to the plate. And take on the responsibility to say, well, listen, I agree to that Fourth Amendment. And these other secret messengers are completely blowing away that side of the Fourth Amendment. So what's the bear with me one more second. Right. So what does the government do? Well, what they do is like what happened to a dear friend of mine in Washington, D.C., who was using 
a secret messenger to communicate with somebody that he did not know was an insider trader. Um, mm -hmm. So they had the, they, they knew that he was communicating, but they couldn't collect evidence. So what they do, the FBI comes to his house, busts the door down basically, and takes all of the electronics of the house. This wow. person was using disappearing messages, could never prove that they were, he was not involved in insider trading in, wow. during the prosecution of the insider trading. He winds up losing his job over it because he right. couldn't ever prove. And so when you see the takedowns, you know, oh, you know, I'll, I'll say it, P. Diddy, I'm not defending yeah. P. Diddy. I don't, I don't know P. Diddy. But these guys are just going to bust doors down and they're going to take all your electronics because they can't, they can't conduct kind of warranted search. You know, so my right. assertion is there needs to be an option in the marketplace okay. and we're offering bunker to, to say privacy and security balanced with accountability. That's my, that's my thing. Oh, yeah, like, well, like it's a really good point. Homework, yeah. Yeah. Really good. That yeah, was a good point. Point. It's the first time I've ever told it in public. Yeah, that was well, real. I, I get it now. That's my uh, but yeah. So what was you're, it really, guys? What you're yeah, saying? Yeah, you really brought that full circle with the accountability. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank yeah. you for so, letting me do that. So yeah, what yeah. what you're saying is we can keep our communications private, but mm -hmm. it's, we don't have to do that through a disappearing act that we can't control those servers or where those messages went, so that we actually can prove. Look, I was talking to him, but. It was because we went we had a, a mutual friend from college. Look, we had no Correct. I was not involved in any insider trading. Here's like I have the Correct. if I'm a user of bunker, I can show them my text Correct. with the person. Yeah. Right. I, yeah. I own I yes. own my dad. I and, own my And day. just my thing is like makes perfect I sense. Believe in privacy. I fight for privacy. I really mm -hmm. do. So and so that fourth amendment says we have a right to privacy. But the other side of it is we've got to get law and order in a balanced way. And, right. you know, we got to trust something. And listen, I, we all know the court system might be liberal or conservative, this stuff, but it is the best system we have to bet on. Correct. Otherwise, yeah. we just decay into absolute societal chaos, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So it's really important because you bring up a good point. So when we see these... And no, by no means is anybody here condoning or making a judgment one way or the other on P. Diddy or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But the mm -hmm. point is, is we like law enforcement doesn't have another option. You're leaving law enforcement without an option other than seizing everything and breaking Correct. in. Because if we don't grab your device, we can't really get like you can't you can't issue subpoena to the tox. To the company that owns correct. Tox, yeah. because the That's owner correct. is not controlled by our laws, right? They're they're not located in New Hampshire, right? It's located yes. in the Eastern Bloc. We can't we can't get those feeds, and so the only way of doing it is breaking down the door, grabbing your device to see if you're doing it. And if it's not there, then you can't really even prove you mm -hmm. didn't do it. Yes, like well, you can't defend you know, there yourself. Is, the government has only one other option, and you're seeing this play out in Europe. Which in which they're just like, fine, we will just take over your phone, whether you know it or not, right. and we're going to surveil you without warrant. And so in the right. States, that's FISA 702. Basically, right. I'm not saying that FISA 702 gives them the ability to hijack your phone, but FISA 702 in the States, all, and this goes back 20 years, all the way back to the Patriot Act, so it's across all parties – the tendency will be for governments to aggressively surveil without permission. Yep. Um, and I don't want to be a part of that for no. sure, unless no, we can and this find really, a balance. This separates that. This inoculates that need for them to have to do that. If more and more organizations created apps like this or more people would in, would would leverage apps like this, then you wouldn't have to have that problem. You wouldn't have to, like, first of all, there wouldn't be surveillance because it's all private. It's all locked down. There's a very limited attack service. And then B, you're accountable, meaning you now can prove that you're innocent or that you were guilty, right? And yes. so yeah. that's really good. But, so we if, have you, if you're not doing anything illegal, you have nothing to worry about, right? It is yeah, a really we're also good not going to give way. Into, we're not going to give into surveillance. I mean, right. we're not going to give it. Yeah. 
No, yeah, phenomenal. so like Stacey Aruda, she's an FBI veteran, and she's still super active in the law enforcement community. She actually uses um, Bunker to take in tips from her field-level informants because oh, if something wow. goes wrong with a field-level informant, she wants to be able to prove, yeah. like, hey, man, that's what that's what the informant told me. Right. You know, so she wants a path of accountability. That's really smart. It protects like the chain of custody. It protects this yeah, person yes. and actually said this. It doesn't disappear and fall off to some random servers that nobody can track down or anything like that. Let me ask you, yes. um, the secure cloud, where is the cloud located? I'm sure we'll be asked that. So I'm um, sure you've, it's distributed. you've been asked The clouds, you know, I don't want to name vendor names. Yeah, um, okay, and I know, that, yeah. I know that obfuscation is not a security technique. Uh, but but what I will say is that we've evolved from the very beginning of the company's development. We involved people from compliance and security that are the largest and best in the world uh, from the very beginning. And pardon me for my ap- obfuscation, but I'm going to do it anyway because it just saves one step. Um, no, that's I, perfectly fine. Yep. Okay. That's good. That's that's excellent. So um, and so it. It meets banking compliance regulations. So if somebody's using it, it's fully compliant. Um, will you got? Do you guys provide, like, if there's a compliance need or somebody's working at a bank and they are using this, do you provide the evidence that's needed to meet the compliance or whatever? Well, I think volume or an exam, something like that. Yeah. All or, right. So finance is pretty interesting. So what's mm-hmm. happening in finance, you may or may not have followed this, but there, this thing I've described about the Fourth Amendment and the right to, to be- have accountable than privacy and security, that's, there's SEC laws called record keeping and FINRA Correct. as well. And there, they've issued about $2.5 billion of fines for the secret messenger apps. Mm-hmm. So in that finance community, you have to provide this capability for the Se- Securities Exchange Commission because if they do have an insider trading case, right, you they have, have to be, be able, able to, to provide right. the record keeping evidentiary trail. And so there, it's it's mandated by by SEC FINRA, and the same for HIPAA as well. By the way, right. And so this complies with that. This this allows Correct. you to do it because it allows you to say, here were the communications, right? Correct. And so that's phenomenal. That's great. And it's really I I saw several videos um that you have on on the site and the it's so easy to use. You create folders, you yes. share folders. It works kind of like Google Drive. I know they're no they're not similar, but I mean it's that Ooh. simple. It's that it simple. Is, right. It's very intuitive. You don't. I never needed a training on Google Drive. Right? Like it's yes. very intuitive. Like you can yes. figure out how to do it. You can upload your images. Everything. It's really good. Well, that's great. Well, thank you. That's fantastic. well. That's the vision, guys. I mean, that's literally the vision is to just protect human beings. And I think that we've lost something by allowing ourselves. I'm going to give one last thing. I'm. I think we've done ourselves a disservice by allowing ourselves to be called consumers. I think we're a lot more than Mm. consumers. Consumers don't have rights, you know, so we've allowed our rights to be stripped back. And we're more than that. We're people. You know, many of us are citizens, but whether you're a citizen or not, you're a human being. The United Nations Special Rapporteur on Privacy, there's rights. And under the Fourth Amendment of our Constitution, we have rights and I encourage all of us to think of our to to not allow ourselves to be thought of as consumers where, you know, you kind of have this thing, this dynamic now. Now, this isn't a reported crime, but if, we all know that if you give someone your credit card, it's just and they're billing you in a way you don't. It's like a battle to get somebody on the phone. And, and the only way to go through is the, is the credit card company. And we should we should be better represented than that by our politicians. And we should have rights as human beings that extend into the tech arena. And I think that's the challenge of the 21st century. Can we take the lessons learned from the past that we know govern a society in a a balance of freedoms and accountability? And can we take those concepts and extend them into the tech world so that we can flourish in freedom 
privacy, security, and, 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 and financially. And I think that's going to be a huge challenge that we all face in the 21st century. And I want to be a part of that, whatever, whatever we can, whatever bunker can contribute. Well, that's fantastic. Um, and we appreciate your time and we appreciate the insight. And we really like what you're driving at with bunker mm. because um, I, I, I was curious when I saw the, the site and the information on privacy and security, that part I got, but accountability, I was like, well, I want to ask him about that. What does he mean? And now I understand because yeah. now yeah. it's about, you got me with that one. yeah, it, it really long, does the accountability piece. The only thing yeah. that I've done that for an aha level for me in this episode, and I encourage the listeners to go back and listen again, is yeah, the initiative. Check it you out because and we appreciate you sharing that, that initiative at Hamilton, something else that's incredible. Um, and I thank you, Kurt. I really enjoyed this. You're a good dude. I really feel like you were doing things the in the right is correct. for all the right reasons. Yep. And uh, man, if you ever need my volunteers to come out, then a ditch or whatever. Right? <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of Thank ditch you. digging and application development, that. Mark. This is the reason, the reason I reference <laughs> Dude, so this is what I get for having my Kentucky guy on the podcast. He's oh, like, we'll dig a ditch, pop, man. I will pop, fire yeah. up. I will load up my truck with bourbon, and we will head over there. I'm like, dude, we're they're working on app development. Just relax. If you ever run across the way, be sure to reference the fact that you're a leader. He went to UK, so he's familiar he with all those SEC. <laughs> you will get his attention oh, really hard. Football, is. we did pretty good. Basketball, they always, they always, you know, they kind of outdid us. But yeah. I'll mention that to him. <laughs> yeah. I really appreciate you guys. I appreciate the show. I appreciate. I really appreciate the support. This is the first time I've really gone that deep talking about these ideas publicly. I've been reticent to do that, but. Well, we all have to take on some amount of responsibility to bring back this beautiful world that we do have when there's law, order, freedom, and for us to to see our kids and our grandkids fulfill their human potential. Absolutely. Yeah. And it can it it supports families. It's a good safe way for families to share information, travel and share their information without it getting abused. And mm -hmm. uh I really like the I really appreciate the context in which yeah. the product, yeah. which is a another oh, layer yeah. of security yeah. with a low threshold, right? So um it, you know, we, we will have links to everything in the show notes and we invite you to reach out. You can reach out to Kurt as well directly. So um thank you so much for your time, yeah. man. B U N K R bunker dot life is the is the website. And then I'm on LinkedIn if anybody wants to send a message about philanthropy or bunker any anything you want. Absolutely. It's 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 bunker B U N K R dot life. Correct. Yep. So check it out, everybody. Thank you so much, Kurt. Appreciate meeting you. Thanks, guys. Well, that wraps this up. Thanks for joining everybody. Hope you got value out of digging deeper behind the scenes of security and cybercrime today. Please don't forget to help keep this going by subscribing free to our YouTube channel at Cybercrime Junkies Podcast and download and enjoy all of our past episodes on Apple and Spotify podcasts so we can continue to bring you more of what matters. This is Cybercrime Junkies, and we thank you for joining us.